So hello, we're ready for a shift in organ system. As we think about bone tissue, the skeletal system is under development in our body much like it is in the body of all vertebrates. We have hard land bones. Bones developed in the ocean because those animals were in the water, they are more flexible, even though they allow the development of a bigger body because the skeleton is now stronger. They're more flexible than the bones that developed when those animals started coming out of the water. When you're walking around in the air, the effects of gravity, the buoyancy from the atmosphere is much less than the buoyancy from the water. And therefore, bones have to become stronger. Another feature of our evolution here on Earth is that land-dwelling animals with hard land skeletons went back into the water. And because they now had a skeleton that was so much stronger, they diversified into the largest animals ever seen on Earth, the cetaceans including the whales, represent the largest life forms ever on the surface of the earth. The blue whale is the largest animal type that we have evidence of here on earth. So the first function of the skeletal system is support, size, shape, strength, and movement from hard internal bones. We set that skeleton up and we hang all of our soft tissues on it. Secondly, within the body, there are some tissues that are much more delicate than others. So for example, nervous tissue, the brain, um, the cardiovascular system, especially the heart, the major vessels, the lungs, all are subject to extreme stress from the constant activity, but need protection. And so this is where bones provide hard surroundings, hard cases, so that the, um, delicate organs are protected from shock or from injury. So we're going to see the most protected area is the brain. At maturity, it becomes a solid bony uh, cavity. The spinal cord it has to be flexible, but the big blocky bones are held together tightly by connective tissue and moved by muscle so that they protect that spinal cord. This kind of uh, picket fence arrangement of our ribs defines the thoracic cavity and protects the upper part of our ventral cavity. Bones form joints. Joints are, by the way, called articulations, and we're accustomed to thinking about those in our fingers or our elbows, but articulations are actually anywhere that two bones come together. Some joints join and then become immovable, the definition. But for most of our movable joints, they actually define our bodily movement. Not only does the elbow allow the forearm to flex in this plane only, but when we get to 180 degrees, we notice it doesn't allow it. It flexes and extends, but it doesn't hyperextend because of the structure of that elbow. And the same is true for all our movable joints. Bones are also storage vessels. We have homeostasis maintaining a concentration of many, many different ions and molecules in the body. And in some cases, we will take a level of, of something that's high, like calcium or phosphate. If there's too much in the body, we can remove some of that calcium and phosphate by just making a few more crystals of bone. Likewise, if the soluble calcium drops to its low level, we can take some bone and chew it up and put it back in solution. So it basically acts as a storage, but also kind of as a, a bank account to be drawn on or deposited in. Fat storage as yellow bone marrow is also another element of our uh, uh, storage in the skeleton. Number five. This one's a big one. In the other class, AMP2, we're talking about cardiovascular system and blood.
we just got into the lymphatic system and the immune system. All of our white blood cells, all of them, are generated by the red bone marrow inside the bone. So all of our blood cells come from bone marrow. Topics for the osseous tissue that we'll go through in order is we'll look at the skeletal system and how it forms from individual bones. I want to make a point here. Because a bone is such a distinct thing, we've always just called it bone. But we have this hierarchy, and I want to relate bones to the hierarchy. If I said to you, what is the organ of the skeletal system? Your reply would be that each individual bone is an organ of the skeletal system. The humerus bone that forms the upper arm is the organ of the skeletal system. Um, and uh, the same will apply, by the way, to muscles. Each named muscle is an organ of that system. The bone and skeleton is something that achieves an adult growth. I've been this size and dimension since I was about 22. So it doesn't look like my skeleton has changed much. But in fact, that outward appearance of stability is deceptive. The bone and the skeleton is dynamic throughout life. We are constantly turning bones over. So even though the bone may not change in size or appearance, its minerals are constantly being dissolved out, extracted, and redeposited. As we use our bones, they develop little cracks. They develop little spines sticking up. Well, we chew those off and we deposit in new bone through the majority of our life. So it is a dynamic system. The bone types will be categorized by shape, and we will recognize bones based on their bone markings, those bumps, those holes, those ridges, those surfaces that are smooth and provide the moving surface of the joint. Those are all characteristic, and each one of them has a specific function. We'll look at the bone cells and membranes, all living things are made of cells. So if we're talking about a skeletal system, the skeleton is something that cells do. How do they do it? We'll also take up this issue of development because we start out as that single squishy cell and then we become two and four and eight and so forth. And at that point, there aren't any bones. How do we get those single squishy cells to start making bones? and to develop the skeleton from something that begins kind of this size and ends up like this. How do we control that metabolism and remodeling? Bones are also like skin. They can repair themselves. And the better your treatment, you can get a repair so the bone works good as new. Finally, bones and aging. What happens to the bones when you reach that threshold? and pass from robust, older age to geriatric decline. I want to point something out about our terminology. And this is something that's reinforced by uh, the textbook with its uh, emphasis on word roots. Word roots are defined and, de and derived from Latin and Greek roots, which always mean the same thing. So if you learn to recognize the roots, you can actually will uh, recognize a word you've never seen before. In the skeletal system, these prefixes, ost, osti, osteo, and ossi, all refer, their derivations of that root that means a bone. They identify the system. We're going to be able to use these roots throughout. So it's, it's, it's important to learn the root as a as a uh, element of its own. So for example, we, we learned that cytology was the study of cells. So an osteocyte would be a bone cell. Um, derm refers to skin, chondro to cartilage, myo to muscle, neuro to nerves, and there's more to come with things like gastro and uro, and um, um, peri uh, that will be derived from this same kind of general method of uh, creating terminology. 
here are different uh, a number of different bone shapes showing what you mean now a couple of them are kind of oddballs this one called a sutural bone when you look at the back of the skull you have these lines where the plates of the major skull bones grow together these are called sutures and sometimes in a real skull you'll get a little island of bone like this it, you'll notice that first of all it's not symmetrical there's a, not another one over here and it's just an anecdotal development here this is called a sutural bone if you look at the real skeleton in the lab you will see that there's a sutural bone or two in the back of that skull but like i say they're different some people don't have any at all down here is a sesamoid bone these are also uh the the regular one the patella it was named because it resembled a sesame seed to the to the viewer but we also have a number of bones that occur principally here in our hands and in our feet where individual sesamoid bones develop anecdotally meaning that you might have two three or four that are unnamed sesamoid bones especially in your feet um, these might not occur equally on both feet occasional bones the others it's pretty easy to see where we got the name irregular bones mean there's nothing in your geometry class that's going to give you a shape to describe the effect of a vertebra or a scapula they are irregular in their shape and specifically tailored to the bone the structural and the movement processes in that region of the body short bones are just that but the dimensions are are relatively equal small blocky bones the carpal bones in the wrist are a good example eight bones crammed together with so many joints that even though each joint is limited in its uh, movement when you put all those eight joints and all their interconnecting uh, uh, eight bones and all their interconnecting joints together you get a lot of flexibility and strength in the wrist flat bones means that it's sort of like a pancake its thickness is small compared to its diameter or length and width the flat bone of the skull shown here the parietal bone good example of just such a bone the long bones same thing there's one a basic a dimension the length which is large compared to the diameter so using this system you can characterize and classify each one of these bones when you look for for example irregular shapes we talked about the vertebra but look at this pelvis look at that scapula it's kind of hard to um, call it anything but irregular short bones in the hands and in the feet long bones and, and especially in the appendages uh, the ribs are a good example of a long bone and so forth so from that basic shape description we will look at a thing called bone markings it's important that you learn these bone markings and this is one of those tables it looks unending oh my gosh why would we ever learn this terminology and the reason is there's tremendous payback once you know these bone markings you can identify a specific part of a specific bone that's absolutely essential when you're trying to figure out where does that ligament that's crossing the joint attach this bone to the bone below the joint where does that marking exist where the tendon from the muscle that crosses uh, below the joint crosses the joint and attaches to the bone above it these bone markings are also the source of some of our um, uh, uh, regional terms so again this is how you build upon um, a terminology bone markings are of several categories and it's important to realize first of all when we say a process that's basically any feature on the surface of a bone that's a bump or a projection so we're going to use this term process in the general way and we're going to first see a category of processes that are formed where tendons attach bone to muscle or 
ligaments which attach bone to bone across the joint. So these can be broken down into different kinds of bumps or processes. If it's large and rough, it's a trochanter. Smaller, rough, a tuberosity. And small and more rounded, a tubercle. If it's a ridge, kind of a line, straighter curved, that forms a prominent edge, that's, a, that's called a crest. If it's lower, it's called a line. A point is called a spine. These are all of the markings where bone and bone and muscle and bone attachments are formed by ligaments and tendons. So when we decide to talk about the joints and how they're formed, and then talk about how the muscles and how they move the joints, and these will be the terminologies we use. We see processes for the articulation of adjacent bones. And by articulation, we mean the smooth part that fits together. So a ball and socket joint has this socket. The internal part is smooth. It appears almost polished. And a ball fits in it like this. Those surfaces, I won't call the articulation surface, they move past each other when the shoulder joint or the hip joint performs its movements. So we will see a polished globe-like thing, sometimes on the end of a shaft, by called a head. And if there is a shaft there, that connection is called a neck. And on other uh, bones, we will see uh, smooth, rounded, smooth grooved or small flat surfaces, condyles, trochlears, and facets. There will be places where the bone appears hollowed out. Uh, a shallow depression is called a fossa and a narrow groove is called a sulcus. We're going to use this term again and again. A, a groove is a great place to run connective tissue to anchor blood vessels uh, to keep them out of the way, especially if if uh, something is moving. Openings. Sometimes you have to go across the bone from one side to the other. And if it's a rounded passage, it's a foramen. But we also have canal, meatus, fissure, and sinus as prominent marking names. So here we see some of these. Here is the femur, the longest bone in the body, the largest bone in the body, with a shaft that is relatively regular in its appearance, kind of rounded in its appearance. But up here, we see this large, bumpy projection, a process called a trochanter. This narrowed portion is called the neck around the articular surface that is the head. This is what anchors the proximal end of the femur into the hip socket. Down at the other end, we're forming a knee. And you can see the, the facet called a condyle, this kind of grooved surface looks smooth and polished. This is where the knee joint uh, meets. But around you'll see it's raised and roughened. Here's a bump called a tubercle. And you see these pits? These pits are where ligaments actually attach to, to uh, collagen that penetrates into the bone. Here we have the skull in all of its colored glory. And we basically see sinuses. These are cavities that are within the bones where they're drawn. So this is the maxillary sinus because this orange bone is the maxilla. It's completely surrounded by bone, but there are openings that connect it to the nasal and oral cavities uh, in the vicinity. This, there's a foramen, a rounded hole, and this long extended split at the back of the orbit of the eye is called a fissure. Here is the humerus. We pick up a tubercle and another head, a neck, a tuberosity, a long bump. That raised bump is a place where a, a tendon is going to attach in order to uh, help motivate the shoulder. Down here, this depression is called a fossa, and this is called a trochlea because of its V-shape. Now, going forward, going forward, here's that shallow depression called a fossa, and that extended point called the spine, and so on. Take a look at these and commit them to memory. 
bone structure, if you look inside, is relatively complex. We do have places where the bone material and bone crystals are extensive and they form a solid mass called compact bone, which basically circles the entire outer surface. Where the bone experiences high stress in its operation, the bone will be thicker. In areas with little stress, it will be thin. And this is some place to think about stress. For example, if you think about me holding a piece of paper, you know that the paper's thin enough that I can take it, and if I'm working against its thickness, rip it right in two. That means that thin paper is not strong in that direction. If you hold it up, I might even take my finger and be able to poke through the thin uh, thickness, the thin uh, dimension of the paper. But if you take that paper and do something in, in another way, so take that paper by its edges and don't start a tear, but pull and see, can you pull that paper lengthwise or even widthwise and pull it apart? Turns out that's very, very difficult to do. So a thin piece of bone can be strong in two dimensions, but basically if there's no stress applied front to back, it might be very, very thin. This compact bone on the inside becomes a series of struts of basically bone spikes that are hooked together. It, to me, it kind of looks like a pile of jacks. And with airspace between them, this is called um, this is called spongy bone because of its appearance, and it still confers a great deal of strength, but makes the overall bone much lighter. In a large bone, especially, you will have this then open cavity called the medulla. This is the medullary cavity of the bone. This is again a femur in long section. And within the medullary cavity have populations of cells that line the cavity and also cells like marrow that uh, fill major portions of it. Looking at a, a cross-section of the parietal bone, this flat bone shows the compact bone that forms the outer surface. And these individual rods, the diploe, that form the spongy bone. You'll notice that they are somewhat irregular. It's not a regular repeating structure like we would see in the superstructure of a roof, but they form so many connections in all directions that they provide a significant support. So it's likely that this is as, as uh, resilient as a solid bone. This allows lots of space for bone cells and for marrow for bone cell production or blood cell production all over the body. There's another interesting feature right here, and that's these projecting kind of sawtooth points, little fingers. The junction between the parietal bone and the temporal bone or between the parietal bone and the frontal bone are not flat and smooth, but are finger-like projections that interdigitate. That means this. They fit together like this. Now, what did we say about projections, folds, and bunches of grapes, and stacks of coins? They produce increased surface area. And when you're bonding two surfaces together, that surface area is what determines the overall strength. Increase the surface area that's bonded together, and the joint is much stronger. This is one of those immovable joints that we call the suture. And these sutures are so strong that although they're actually laced together with fibers, this is where collagen laces the frontal bone to the parietal bone in a suture that is permanent and immovable. But it's so strong that if you have, you know, if you are uh, examining something like a mummy, or something like a, uh, a body from long ago, an archaeological find. This collagen connection is so strong that if this has not been crushed or deformed by some force, this would come out of the ground as a complete skull. The only part that would typically fall off would be the mandible. 
because this is the only movable joint. The entire skull is assembled by these on these wiggly lines called sutures, which make the skull a permanent protective case. What cells do we find? And how do these cells make bone? Well, first of all, bone is a connective tissue. And what was the characteristic uh, of connective tissue? Scattered living cells with space between them for non-living matrix. Now, the non-living matrix is a crystalline structure called hydroxyapatite. It's a complex mineral. I mean, it contains several different atoms, but in, in large part, it's constructed from calcium, phosphate, and carbonate um, elements. So what we see as we cut across a long bone is the compact bone outer, uh, outer rim. By the way, there's in a living bone, there's gonna be a rim of living cells around the outside and a rim of living cells around this medullary cavity as well. We see inside the spongy bone and the medullary cavity. And these boxes identify the region that we've uh, blown up in magnification. So let's go out here to the compact bone and blow it up over here. This is a bone cell called an osteocyte that is responsible for managing the bone matrix in its vicinity. These kind of cream colored irregular shapes are the bone minerals themselves. And when you cut across, you notice there are little tubes that emanate out from this cavity and penetrate the bone matrix, basically in all directions, and connecting to the cavity of the next bone cell. So an osteocyte occupies this cavity. The cavity is called the lacuna. That's where the cell and nucleus and most of the organelles live. But these canals called canaliculi radiate out in all directions. Uh, and by that I mean 3D. So they're basically radiating out of the top to osteocytes that are above and below. And they don't really represent partitions, they're, they're truly tubes. The membrane of this osteocyte will move out into these tubes, and so cytoplasm is in contact with these uh, bone elements. So the chemistry of this uh, cell, the polymerization of crystals to form compact bone, the remodeling of tearing it out and replacing it is going on in this lacuna by this osteocyte. Now, if you look at the surfaces, outer and two drawings on the inner, you see a different kind of structure. On the outer surface, the outer perimeter of the bone, here you can see that bone matrix, see the canaliculi and kind of the tail right there of one of those osteocytes. But on the outer surface, you see this gel-like matrix, which is called osteo, shown in blue, where the pointer is now, and a population of cells that cover it almost completely. These are called osteoblasts. Now, osteo means bone. Blast is a term you should remember. It means making or becoming. The osteoblast is the cell that can build new bone matrix, and it often does it by, in the growing bone, by making an osteoid covering that it then mineralizes and converts to bone. When we look at the inner surface, we see a coating that's not so continuous. There are patches of bare bone um, uh, exposed, but there are still also many, many cells lining this spongy bone. Over here, we have a drawing of the, uh, the layer, by the way, not the individual cell, but the layer is called the endosteum. This outer layer is called the periosteum. Peri means the outer perimeter. Uh, endo means within, and so those terms make sense. 
This unusual cell right here is called an osteoprogenitor cell. It is the bone stem cell. This cell will divide and divide and divide to produce new osteocytes. Over here, still on the inner surface, we have a very unusual cell, very large in its dimensions compared to the osteoblasts shown here but unusual in that it's formed with these black spots. Those are the nuclei. And this cell is multinucleate, looking like it has 12 to 18 nuclei in a single cell. This is called an osteoclast. And an osteoclast is the counter to the osteoblast. If an osteoblast builds bone, an osteoclast consumes it. It makes enzymes and acids and applies them to the crystalline bone and dissolves it to release their minerals. Osteoblasts build, osteoclasts consume. So you can see how these cells would work in concert. At the beginning of the development of the skeleton, osteoblast activity is going to be making bone and growing bone and far outstripping the activity of the osteoclast. The osteoclast is going to be very active for regulating the um, uh, turnover of minerals in bone by tearing out damaged bone and replacing it with new crystalline bone, refortifying the bone from within. Osteoclast is going to be important in remodeling throughout life because you do have to uh, remove small areas of damage in order to keep the bone strong. If a bone is broken, then there are fragments of bone around that break and that bone uh, that is deprived of oxygen or deprived of nutrients, bone cells, osteocytes within the bone matrix will die. That's a dead bone portion and osteoclast will remove those edges and ends as well as any fragments that are left uh, as part of the bone repair process. Now, one of the things that will occur to us as we look at the cellular and tissue structure, the histology, throughout AMP1 and AMP2 is that there's a certain shape called a tube and the body is really good at making tubes. This structure is called an osteon, and we have cut across the diameter of a long tube to reveal this cut surface. This circular structure, since I'm a botanist, the first thing I thought of was kind of looks like tree rings. And in fact, it is organized that way. These black spots, black arcs, are the lacuna where osteocytes live. Notice how they're spread out. They are separated cells as we find in all connective tissue. Notice also that they are connected by a very fine, almost spider webby series of things that look like kind of spokes going from this central hole, the central canal, and radiating out to the perimeter. Those are the canaliculi that connected all parts of this bone with the cytoplasm of one of these cells. So this is a cut surface of osteon, and the way you make compact bone is sort of like uh, basically unboxing a box of pencils. You hold the pencils like this, and the tubes line up edge to edge, and that's what you're seeing in this joining. Here's an osteon that is positioned between one, two, three, four, five, surrounding osteons and possibly six down here. This close connection allows for new layers of bone to be laid down, the so-called interstitial lamella that bind these together into the densest aggregation of bone and the strongest structure, compact bone. When we prepare this bone cutting in a little different way, we clean it off we can see the central canal with remnants of those blood vessels still retained. But we've cleaned these surfaces. Notice these concentric rings. 
called uh, lamella. Lamella just means layers, and it's kind of like a target with a central bullseye and surrounding rings. Also shown in this surface are the spaced out lacuna. They occur both in the osteon, shown here, and in these interstitial lamella. Notice that these provide homes for bone cells as well. So here is one, two, three osteons in this picture. You can see what a dense aggregation there is. No real space, but basically it's a group of tubes glued together. A drawing shows you this in three dimensions. We've been looking down on this circular polished surface of an osteon, so it looked like a target. Central canal with blood vessels penetrate the osteon from top to bottom. You can see that here, providing ample blood flow. Why is that? Well, it's full of cells. Cells need oxygen and nutrients and waste need to be carried away. So bone is a vital, it's a hard, strong tissue. It's our least flexible tissue. But it's very much a dynamic living tissue because of its cellular content. You'll notice that these central canals that run up and down are connected by these so-called perforating canals, which at intervals move across and allow the outer uh, circulation from this artery to penetrate into the bone and through perforating canals between here and here, between here and here, basically permeate the blood with blood flow before that blood flow enters the medullary cavity and capillaries that support the endosteum. The endosteum will coat this spongy bone here. And um, also the marrow, red and yellow, that is performing other functions in this medulla. A couple of things to note. Notice that we've cut these concentric lamella of an osteon and allowed them to extend up as concentric circles around the central canal showing you this up and down structure. Notice how these lamella contain osteocytes and lacuna all the way up and down the cut surface. So there's never a place where a piece of the bone matrix is far away from the nearest living cell. We're going to see that there's going to be something added to the bone crystal itself that will be a protein fiber called collagen that will reinforce the bone and make it even stronger. Now down here in spongy bone, I want to make a point. It's not so compact, still very strong, but you'll notice that it still is a system of tubes. Those tubes are uh, joined together by bone deposition at odd angles, producing this air space alternation with the solid rods. But when we cut into it, what do we see? These tubes, although shaped somewhat differently and smaller than the osteon, still have this lacuna osteocyte and canaliculi structure. It's just that the rods are generated and connected on a different geometry. The organization of the osteons in lamella or layers. This is a circular layer that surrounds the central canal. Notice that it's lined with living cells. This endosteum is the surface, so that's the epithelial tissue on the surface of the central canal. But more important is to realize the collagen, the fiber content of the bone and bony osteum. Here's a general principle that you can appreciate. Things that are very dense, heavy, and strong, if they're dense and heavy and strong, they typically, the stronger they get, the more brittle they become. So if you've ever worked with cement, and you know it's strong from our roads and our sidewalks and the structure of our building, reinforced cement can basically be a uh, 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 poured around, cement is poured around a reinforcing steel rod called rebar. And with that rebar there to distribute the stresses and limit its movement, you can build a skyscraper of any height. 
Now this collagen fiber reinforces bone in much the same way. And what I want you to notice is that in this junction between the lamella, we have laid down these fibers in an, an angled configuration and the alternating fibers are running at right angles to one another. So most osteons have more than three layers. In fact, there may be a dozen. And alternating the collagen fiber in this direction, in this direction, in this direction means that if you stress this tube by bending it, you're first of all going to have to bend all the other osteons at the same time. But with this structure, if I try to bend it this way, this layer and this layer pulls tight and reinforces the bone. The secret with something like cement or something like bone is not allow it to move too much. If it moves too much, then it, it breaks. You see the same thing in ceramics. Ceramics are terrifically sturdy materials, hard, durable, with a glaze finish. They literally can last un, un, uh, altered in the ground for years. That's why pottery is so much important to our archaeology. But if you strike a sharp blow, it will shatter. Cement is the same way. If you pour, pour, pour pure cement, the freezing and thawing will basically work that cement apart, going into every cavity with water and then freezing it to expand. That's what produces the cracks in our sidewalks and eventually leads to the degradation of that hard material. So collagen reinforcement is critical to the tensile strength, the flexible strength of our bone. How extensive is the collagen? It turns out that if you weigh a dry bone and then you look at the collagen component, the collagen comprises about 30 percent or almost a third of the weight of the bone. In the same way, there's a significant contribution of weight in a roadway or a bridge by the rebar that you put down before you pour the cement. This spongy bone, this really illustrates this blow up better than my description earlier. Here's compact bone on the femur. Notice where it's thick and thin. But in here, notice that these areas, which basically uh, handle a lot of stress, this is where the muscles are attached that are going to cross this hip and basically provide all the force for moving the hip joint. That means the thigh on the pelvis. It has to be very strong because the muscle is pulling this bone from one position to another. And you notice that it's completely filled with spongy bone. But down here where compact bone surrounds it, it kind of clears out into a uh, medullary cavity. It can be hollow with great strength. We've learned this with our materials. If you have a bar of iron, it has a certain strength. If you take that bar and pour it into a pipe or a tube, it often has the same strength as a hollow tube as it does as a solid bar. This is what engineers think about all the time, strength of materials and the shapes and what that does to the ability to support weight. Now here are the tuberculae, these tubes of the spongy bone, and you can see the pores for the canaliculi opening to the surface. In these round tubes, you see lamella that are concentric lamella that are formed by the osteocytes in the lacuna between those layers. This outer surface, as I said, has a, a living cellular layer that's different called the endosteum. That's from that previous uh, drawing. We saw the presence of both osteoblasts and osteoclasts uh, on this inner surface. The overall, the overall um, picture I want to draw of a bone is something that becomes permanent in its size and shape in your body, but is managed by high levels of activity of cells inside the bone, on the inner surfaces of the cavities, 
on the outer surface of the bone that are interacting, metabolizing, turning over all through your life. Now, as you press down on a bone, you have to think about posture, and we're going to have the uh, so-called anatomical position uh, to illustrate the position of the femur. The, the pelvis and its socket basically sits on top of this ball joint and transfers the body weight straight down. Now, that compresses the medial shaft of the femur, and the construction of the lower femur distributes that weight broader, so it spreads the force out over a larger area in the knee. When you compress this side, you produce a lifting or tension on the lateral side, so it has to be equally thick over here so the bone does not pull apart from the compression. Here is a figure showing what I was trying to describe when we looked at the medullary cavity and spongy bone. On the outer surface, we see a number of structures that form a cell layer called the periosteum. Do you notice how continuous it is? It is much more like a sheet. As you pull it away, you see these epithelial cells forming the periosteum surface that will bind to the outer surface of this bone. We see the canaliculi, the osteocytes in their lacuna, and we see the, the connections here between the various osteocytes. The lamella out here are changed. Rather than forming tube-like osteons, there, are, there is a layer of lamella that circles the outer part of the entire mature bone the circumference. So these are called circumferential lamella. They're very different before you get to the osteon structure within. This periosteon also contains collagen fibers, and they're very important. Not only do we have collagen, these blue fibers, within the bone, but we have collagen fibers. Look at this fiber here that runs through the bone, it's deeply embedded in the bone, and then it comes out and runs into the fibrous layer of the periosteum. Now, the fibrous layer of the periosteum is a is sort of like a um, that green pad, a scotch bright pad. It's very strong fibers, flexible in some directions, but very, very strong and bound together very tightly. They provide the outer structure that surround the bone. One thing to think about, here's a bone. Muscles are moving around this bone. Let's say it's the femur. Muscles are contracting and relaxing all around. So there's all this contraction and relaxation, scraping at the blood vessels. How do you anchor these down and prevent them from damage? You, you do that by connective tissue into the fibrous layer of the periosteum. When you get to a point where two joint, two, two bones meet, they form a joint, and the fibrous layer of the periosteum, that uh, uh, collagen sheath, forms a sheath and kind of a capsule around the synovial cavity at the joint, and then is continuous with, it goes across the joint, and joins to the fibrous layer of the periosteum of the bone above the joint. So it provides this one element of connecting the bones and holding them in that kind of columnar uh, fashion, keeping them lined up and keeping the socket in joint. The endosteum is incomplete. You kind of see that here, but it is repeating. Here are the presence of the inner membrane of the medullary cavity with osteoblasts with osteoprogenitors and with osteoclasts, all in evidence to manage the uh, cavity and the surface of the bone, while the osteocytes manage this inner structure that has become compact. So we start as a single squishy cell and the 
in the embryo stage, in the zygote stage, where we have lots of squishy cells, what do we first notice when it's time to form a bone? And what we notice is the presence of two types of bone formation. The most uh, widespread type is called endochondral ossification. This is the main way we form bones. And the name tells you everything. Endo means within. Chondral means cartilage. And that's what we're going to do. Form a hyaline cartilage model and then follow in these figures the visible changes that slowly ossify that cartilage. Now this actually traces the evolutionary history of the earth because as cells began to pile up they formed big larger and larger bodies but very uh, delicate bodies you look at a jellyfish today something that has a very delicate cell structure and can't grow really big because the cells tear apart too easily we need internal support and so the first thing we notice that really produced a change in animal bodies was the development of cartilage skeletons. Now we have examples of those alive today in the sharks and rays, the so-called chondrichthys, chondro, cartilage, ichthys, fish. The presence of this cartilage was stiff enough, provided enough structure that the body could get bigger and could specialize in different ways. Later on, we had a process that turned some cartilage into bone. And that bone gave rise to teeth and jaws and eventually to entire bony skeletons. The swimming fish, um, the osteoichthys, are the bony fish and our native fish, catfish and bass are examples of the osteichthys, uh, a later group. But it came from organisms that originally had cartilage skeletons. So what do we see first? We see a cartilage model. This is hyaline cartilage and it's amorphous and kind of uniform in its appearance. And up to a certain size, the cartilage is is fine for supporting the weight of the developing fetus. But soon we see this kind of central region where the, the cells of the, um, of the cartilage are enlarging and the cartilage itself is producing small nodules of bone. That's the, these are the chondrocytes, the dark spots and these are the initial nodules of bone formed in the center of the diaphysis, the shaft of the cartilage. Now, if we let a little time pass, we'll notice it enlarges and this bone uh, kind of module, the activity of the cartilage uh, it, uh, continues, but as it begins to expand, growing in both directions, a couple of things happen. This defines a clear boundary between the diaphysis, which is the shaft, and the diaphysis begins to form a sheath of actual bone. So this is these, this tan edge here is a cylinder around the central part of this cartilage that forms a complete closed sheath. It encloses it while the central uh, ossification continues. We also notice the arrival of vascular elements, blood vessels that are growing sort of like roots that attach to the surface of the diaphysis as part of the developmental process. The epiphysis is still pure hyaline cartilage with no vasculature, and it is still plenty strong enough to support the weight of the fetus at that size. So let's take a step forward a few more days or weeks and we see something odd. 
we need to reinforce the bone if we're going to continue to increase in length. So the blood vessels grow into it like a root and the tips of the blood vessels invade this inner uh, diaphysis. Now notice this outer sheath is still present and enclosing and reinforcing the central bone. The blood vessel has grown through it, through a foramen, um, and is growing like a root through this central diaphysis. Now as this happens, the bone is lengthening from this region and this region, the junction with the epiphysis, and also forming spongy bone and compact bone elements. And in this in this form, it continues to lengthen. Notice that the ends, the joint forming ends of the bone are still pure cartilage. Now this part is called primary ossification. When you start from the center and you ossify in both directions out. At a little later stage of development, you see the well-developed diaphysis with its outer compact bone and a well-formed periosteum. You see a medullary cavity and the development of spongy bone elements, but the main feature of this right now is the proliferation of this vascular system. This is what's bringing in all the resources to make bone crystals and to feed the division of chondrocytes to make more cartilage. You'll notice two well-developed areas of cartilage production, and as the cartilage is produced, right behind it, we're forming bone. A little bit later, by the way, this is a very late uh, picture of primary ossification. That's going to continue, but in the ends, we get to the point where that hyaline cartilage no longer is firm enough to support the weight of that joint. And we see a similar process called secondary ossification, where blood vessels repeat the endochondral pattern invading, basically surrounding the outer part of the joint, here and here, periosteum and compact bone begin. It's invading of blood vessels forming a central medulla and spongy bone ossification center. So these darker regions are showing you regions of active elongation. This region between the diaphysis and the epiphysis is called the metaphysis, and here and here are the major growing caps uh, that contribute to further bone elongation up and down. Secondary ossification continues and the ends of the bone are differentiated into spongy bone, leaving exposed an articular cartilage. This hyaline cartilage remains in place as the cartilage surrounding here is slowly replaced and the bone actually continues to grow as long as this cartilage is growing. But when the cartilage stops growing and is turned to bone, then that bone has reached its maximum size. So we do see endochondral ossification in this figure. Endochondral ossification showing you this amorphous cartilage with all of its chondrocytes, see them dividing here and we see a medullary cavity developing here, the osteoblasts and the pink osteoid from the osteoblasts that are producing a gel-like matrix that's surrounding these developing nodules and shafts of bone and basically invading this space with bone crystals. Now I want to show you two x-rays as the last uh, thought for today and then we'll end a little early so you can get over and study for your lab practical. This is the x-ray of a hand showing you these growth points, the epiphyseal cartilages. So here is a metacarpal, a single bone when it's mature but with a clear junction down here at the distal end where the epiphysis is still cartilage. This is actively growing. But another feature of this, the reason you can tell this is the hand of a young child is because of all the space. You'll notice there are the presence of all these carpals, 
but you will also notice they appear to be kind of floating out in space. They're not actually floating. They're in contact with one another. It's just that the x-ray goes through cartilage and you can't see the cartilage case on each one of these bones. So if you've ever felt the hand of a young child, you notice how flexible it seems. And that's because these cartilage edges are still forming and do not have not locked up the joints with bony uh, surroundings. These arrows show the epiphyseal cartilage. Notice here on the number one metacarpal, how the epiphyseal, the, the angle is just right. You can basically see between these growing bone centers. This is the expanding cartilage, and it would be surrounded by a large cartilage rim in this location. Here at the bottom of the uh, radius, you'll notice the same kind of thing with what appears to be a split. That's actually just a growing cartilage region as these long bones are actively extended. Now, fix this image in your mind, especially the image there at the wrist, and we'll go to the x-ray of an adult hand. And what do you notice? Much better defined bony edges. And although the x-ray still sneaks between them, this is the joint, and uh, the bony edges are much more close packed, allowing for greater strength and less flexibility. You see the position of the epiphyseal lines in the adult, but they have all but closed. There are cartilage articulation pads between these bones, in this case between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx bone forming this knuckle joint. But in fact, the bones are much more complete in their uh, uh, growth and their forming of joints. Notice how close packed they are. Now, the epiphyseal lines can be seen, <clears throat> but um, um, uh, a closer examination uh, is required than this could be. Oh, I just noticed something. You notice I said that there were random sesamoid bones that form that are unnamed up here, this little uh, uh, nodule right here. This is sesamoid bone, an extra bone here at the base of the thumb. Now, I want to underline that endochondral is sort of our historical way of making bone out of cartilage. The majority of our bones are made in this way, but that's not the only way. It turns out that some bones arise de novo out of the membranes that are forming in the fetus, in the infant, in the child. So I want to end today's uh, recorded lecture at this point. This is the end of chapter six, A, bone tissue.